Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to the Storage Act International Symposium. I'm Yi Chui, a professor in material science engineering at Stanford University. I proudly like to welcome you to the second event of Storage Act Symposium last launch, our first event successfully with two distinguished speakers, Professor Stan Whittingham and Professor Jun Liu. This week, we will continue this exciting chat with two leading scientists in the world on energy storage to join us to give the uh, two seminars, Professor Dr. Khalil Amin and Professor Peter Blues. Um, Carol Amin is a distinguished scientist in Argonne National Lab. Uh, he just won so many awards, I don't really need to uh, repeat. But I would like to mention two of them. Uh, he's a fellow of Electrochemical Society. Recently, he won the very prestigious Global Energy Prize for his uh, contribution in lithium ion batteries. And Peter Blues, is a professor at University of Oxford. He also does not need more introduction. Um, just mention a few things, a few uh, honors about him. He is a fellow of Royal Society as well as a physical secretary. He's also the founder and director of Faraday Institute in UK. As you know, Faraday Institute is perhaps the most important energy storage program and in, uh, in UK. With that, I would like to welcome, if Peter, you can uh, turn on your camera and let's uh, switch, switch to you and please, please uh, share your screen. So thanks very much, Xi. It's good to, uh, thank you for the introduction. It's great to uh, take part in this process. I think it's a super initiative that you've uh, you've taken here in these uh, challenging times for the world when we are, uh, uh, a lot of us are locked down because of the COVID-19 uh, experience. It's great to be able to connect with people across the globe uh, and still talk about science that excites us all. Uh, so grateful for, for you doing this. So I want to um, talk a little bit about lithium cathodes, picking up on one of the themes that, uh, that Carl uh, mentioned. Uh, I should say the picture you see in front of you is, a, is, a, is an image of the skyline of Oxford. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, have my labs in any of those nice historic buildings. Uh, uh, my labs are in rather newer buildings, but maybe a little bit more functional, but not as attractive. So the title of the talk is Walking Back to Happiness, Oxygen Redox Lithium Battery uh, Cathodes. Um, and what's behind the talk is that, uh, the title is that um, I want to look at these lithium rich uh, cathodes which exploit redox reactions on the oxygen as well as the transition metal uh, ions. So in a conventional cathode, and we'll touch on this in the next slide, uh, because I'm conscious we have a, a wide spectrum of expertise, I'm sure, in the audience. In a conventional uh, cathode in a lithium ion battery, uh, one exploits redox reactions on the transition metal uh, to store charge, uh, but to boost that uh, charge storage, and one of the biggest challenges in lithium batteries again, picking up on a nice introduction Carl gave, is if to increase energy density. And one of the biggest challenges in doing that actually relates to the cathode. So boosting the charge storage on the cathode is one of our big problems. And going beyond transition metal redox is one of the potential solutions to do so. The walking back to happiness um, really refers to the fact that right back about 20, 25 years ago, when uh, people like Mike Thackeray and uh, Jeff Dan first uh, uh, reported these lithium rich materials, uh, they showed that um, there was oxygen loss and concluded that that was the main mechanism for the extra capacity on charge. Uh, it turns out that um, they were perhaps more right than we thought for quite a number of years and, uh, and molecular oxygen uh, seems to be at the heart of uh, most of what's happening in these, in these materials, both reversible and irreversible. So just so everyone's on the same page, and I'll go through this very quickly because uh, after Carl's talk, it's maybe a little bit unnecessary, but 
just to remind you of how a lithium ion battery functions, but particularly to focus on this issue of the charge storage mechanism in the cathode. What you see in front of you is a schematic of, uh, I guess, a first generation lithium ion cell with lithium cobalt oxide. And of course, on charging, um, lithium ions are removed from the lithium cobalt oxide particles. And this involves oxidation of uh, uh, cobalt three plus to cobalt four plus. Now, for those of you who are more expert, uh, you'll know that that's a bit of a simplification, even in the case of lithium cobalt oxide. But if I just take this as a simple example to get the concept over that conventional lithium ion cathodes, the type we still use today, um, essentially involve charge compensation for a loss of lithium uh, on charge by oxidation of the transition metal uh, ions. And then on discharge, um, lithium ions return from the, from the graphite back into the lithium cobalt oxide particles, and one reduces cobalt four plus uh, back to three plus. So the point is we're storing the charge on the transition metal ions. If we want to boost the uh, energy density, the energy storage in lithium ion batteries, we need to attack this problem on the cathode and figure out how we can store more charge per unit mass and volume in, in that cathode. So what you see now um, is a plot of the potential versus the specific capacity in milliamp hours per gram uh, for lithium cobalt oxide. And we're going to look at uh, I suppose the evolution of uh, intercalation cathodes for lithium ion batteries uh, over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. So LiCO2 um, is the sort of first generation cathode material um, and um, Carl's talk um, focused a lot on these sort of NMC type materials. So mixed metal, nickel, cobalt and manganese on the transition metal sites of these layered compounds, which boosts capacity at around the same potential. And then to increase energy storage uh, in another way, you can go to high voltages uh, like the uh, nickel manganese spinel or the lithium cobalt phosphate. Well, that's very challenging from the electrolyte stability point of view. You can consider whether you can uh, invoke uh, two electrons per transition metal or such as in these lithium uh, vanadyl phosphates, although they do go over a very wide voltage range. And one of the other options in light blue there are these lithium rich uh, cathode materials, which are, of course are based on the lithium cobalt oxide, the NMC type materials, um, but are increasing the capacity by, as you see on the right hand side, invoking uh, redox reactions on the oxygen to store electrons as well as on the transition metals. And the benefit here is not only that you increase capacity, but you do so at a relatively high potential of around four and a half volts. So that means you increase energy um, as well as uh, not just by increasing the number of electrons stored, but also the energy at which they are stored. However, these materials you know, have a lot of challenges, and I think some of those are captured on the, on the next slide here. Uh, so on the left hand side, what you see is the uh, representation of the crystal structure of, of one of these classic uh, lithium rich materials. This one with the formula that you see here, the so-called lithium-rich NMC. And this is the one I'm going to focus most of the uh, talk on. And we have layers of lithium ions, as one does in lithium cobalt oxide. And then we have transition metal layers with the nickel, manganese, cobalt, and lithium present in those layers. And then on the right, you see here the first uh, cycle, the voltage versus composition or capacity on the first cycle. So charging here and then discharging uh, along here. And immediately you see one of the problems um, of this material is this voltage hysteresis. So when you first charge this material, you oxidize the transition metal ions, the nickel and the cobalt, because the manganese is already fully oxidized. And this is just conventional intercalation chemistry, nothing uh, unusual here in this green region. But then when you go beyond that into the plateau, you're now oxidizing the oxide uh, ions. And the oxidation is happening at four and a half volts, but unfortunately the reduction process is occurring one volt less, 3.5 volts. And so immediately you're losing energy storage, energy density. If you have to operate along this line, you would really like to go back and forth along this one uh, here. So the first cycle voltage hysteresis is one of the, uh, the problems. And then if you keep on cycling, uh, it's represented by these uh, series of black curves you see here. 
you can see that the hysteresis is much less, but there is still some hysteresis. And then there's this voltage fade problem. You see this shift in the uh, positions of these uh, lines here, which represent the, the problem of a, of a creep in the voltage, a bit of a voltage fade on cycling. So these are some of the problems that uh, one has to, ch uh, uh, to face and overcome with these lithium rich materials. The other one, which we'll see in the next slide is of course that uh, as you oxidize the oxide ions, there is indeed oxygen loss um, from the materials um, at the surface. I should also point out that of course this significant change in voltage on first cycle really signals the fact that there is a substantial and important structural change uh, taking place in the material. And understanding this hysteresis is in part about understanding that structural uh, change. And of course the challenge is can we preserve this high voltage and high capacity and retain high energy. So I mentioned that there is oxygen loss. Um, it's not the dominant process in these materials as was originally thought, but it is still present. And we can see that in these in this mass spec experiment here. So we take a cell, we charge it, and we pass an argon carrier gas through it into a mass spectrometer, and we look at the gases evolved. And this is the, the load curve charge and discharge unfolded this time for NMC, for lithium rich NMC. So we're charging here, discharging here, and we're using O18 labeled materials so that any species containing oxygen that we identify, we know that these uh, oxygen species derive from the cathode and not from just decomposition of the electrolyte. So if we look at the oxygen gas release first, you see O2 gas is released towards the end of the charging uh, process, and it is substantially oxygen with 18. So it is coming from the, the cathode material. And then if we look at the CO2, we see that there's carbon dioxide released across the plateau, as well as just beyond the plateau. Now, I think some recent work, um, not by us, but by others such as Hubert Gasteiger, has shown very elegantly that in fact this CO2 uh, is also a, a derived from dioxygen released at the surface, um, but it's singlet oxygen. So dioxygen can come in, comes in two forms, the triplet form, which is the stable one we're used to, but also the singlet excited state form. And it's particularly reactive. You get a small amount of that in the oxygen and that can attack the electrolyte decompose the organic carbonate electrolyte and give rise to CO2 evolution. So basically all of this is about largely about o O2 loss uh, from the surface. But the key take home message from these studies is that the, the loss of dioxygen, far from being the, the dominant mechanism by which these materials can charge, is actually the sideshow. It's the, it's the minor uh, problem. It's still an important problem and you have to mitigate it and you have to stop oxygen loss for all the practical reasons, again, some of them that Carl mentioned. But in terms of understanding where the, the real fundamental origin of where this extra capacity uh, comes from when you start oxidizing oxide ions, it's not the main event. It cannot explain the charging plateau and the subsequent discharge, etc. So to understand that, um, uh, it's been a significant effort by, by some uh, great efforts by a number of groups around the world and it, it still continues today. I'm going to show you some of our recent results. Um, one of the, the techniques that has been particularly valuable at understanding the nature of oxidized oxide ions when you charge these materials is RICS, Resonant, resonant Inelastic X-ray uh, Spectroscopy. And the RICS, uh, basic RICS experiment shown here uh, incident radiation that you impinge on the material causes excitation, in this case from the oxygen 1s states, so it's K edge RICS to high energy states here, empty states here, and then of course the uh, electrons fall back from these oxygen 2p states into the oxygen 1s. Uh, that's why it's called a resonant technique and you can look at the um, emission at various excitation energies, which is what one does uh, in RICS. So to show you the results, so here's our our load curve again, here's our first cycle, charge and discharge, and we want to understand the processes that are occurring in here. Um, so the first thing we do is take some RIC, a RIC spectrum at this point. So we've charged through the normal region. This is the transition metal oxidation region. We're getting into the region we want to understand, which is this oxygen or, or 
or oxidation of the oxide region. And this is the Rick spectrum before we've embarked on our transition across the plateau uh, where the uh, oxide ions are being oxidized. We then collect a spectrum in the, at the end of the charge, it looks like this. So there are changes here and in particular in this region. <clears throat> if we then look at the, the discharge again, so back at the end of the cycle, we see a Rick spectrum, a Rick's emission spectrum, which is very similar to the, to the pristine material. And so in this region here and here lies a clue to what is happening in the bulk of the material when you oxidize the oxide ions. So this is not oxygen loss from the surface electrochemically because RICS is a technique carried out in high vacuum. It can't detect the oxygen that we're, we're commonly used to thinking about the dioxygen, which is the dioxygen lost from these materials at the surface. This is probing the nature of the oxidized oxide ions in the bulk. And it turns out if you look at a spectrum of, of molecular O2, a RICS spectrum molecular O2, it essentially has the same sort of features as the spectrum that you see here at the top of charge. So the long story short is uh, that this is indicating that we seem to have molecular oxygen actually trapped in the material um, at the end of, of charge, and that that molecular oxygen is reduced again back to oxide ions um, at the end of discharge. So just to summarize, oxide ions are oxidized to O2 minus and charge. The oxide, the, the molecular oxygen is trapped in the lattice and then reduced back to O2 minus on discharge. Now, of course, if you're going to generate molecular oxygen uh, and it's going to be trapped in the solid, uh, uh, that's not going to be possible without some structural reorganization. And so that's very much in, in concert with the, uh, the, the change in the load curve that we do, we do see. So here's the, um, I'm going to show you some structural data now um, to indicate the structural changes that we observe in this material. So here's our, our crystal structure again, uh, looking along the layers of this NMC, lithium-rich NMC. And then this is the plan view. We're looking down onto a transition metal layer where you see the cobalt in blue, the manganese in pink, the nickel in gray, and the lithium ions, these blue spheres here. And what you see on the right is the powder diffraction pattern with the highlighted region corresponding to the honeycomb superstructure. So this is the nice honeycomb arrangement that you see of metal ions in the transition metal layers. This is the pristine material before we, we charge. So if we now look at um, the data from scanning transmission electron microscopy, the, the image you see on the left is again looking along the layer, so looking along in this direction, the 0, 1, 0 direction. And these sort of dumbbell features are a classic um, image that you expect from the honeycomb arrangement. This is the, how, what the honeycomb arrangement looks like in STEM uh, looking along the layers. What you see at the end of charge, if you look along these layers, is that you've lost that variation and contrast that you see here. And that's very much indicative of the fact that the transition metals are no longer in a honeycomb arrangement. They've disordered, but largely within the layers. Okay, so the, the white represents the heavy scatterers, the transition metals. There's very little between the layers. They're staying in the layers primarily, but they're disordering uh, intralayer disorder. And you can see if you look at the powder diffraction pattern that these uh, peaks associated with the superstructure, um, as you go from the beginning of the plateau to the fully charged region, you lose those superstructure peaks. That's in keeping with losing the honeycomb and they don't return on discharge. Some further evidence um, for the change in the structure on charge and discharge, you can see here. So this is the lithium-6 NMR, and uh, this represents the center of gravity of the lithium peaks um, in the spectrum of the pristine material. And when you've completed your cycle back to the discharge state, you see that the lithiums do not return to the same environment. They're returned to an environment that's actually, um, on average, less interacting with the manganese than before. So they're, mo they're in more uh, diamagnetic environments than they are here. And this, again, is basically a signature for the fact that they're moving back into positions that are different from the pristine material in this disordered uh, uh, structure. 
So all of this is basically telling us we lose the honeycomb structure largely through in-plane disorder. There is some out-of-plane disorder, but it's only a few percent. And the lithium ions are returning on discharge to different sites. We're not, we're not reverting to this ordered structure uh, that you see here uh, on discharge. So what is, uh, is happening throughout this cycle if we put the evidence for dioxygen formation together with the structural arrangements and indeed a whole lot of DFT that we've also carried out that I don't have time to go into in detail. So here's uh, the transition metal layer in our pristine material again with the nice honeycomb arrangement you see here of the transition metal ions. I've just used one color for all the transition metal ions to make it simpler here and here are the lithiums in, in light blue. So when you charge up the material, you take lithium out of the material, you remove some of the lithium uh, as you reach the beginning of the plateau, but not all. And this is charge compensated, of course, by oxidation of the transition metals. We then charge across the plateau, we remove the rest of the lithium or most of it, and now we've oxidized the oxide ions. Uh, you see those, the red spheres of the oxide ions. So you see them flashing here, representing the oxidation. But when we do that, of course, we weaken the oxygen manganese bond as we oxidize oxide ions. Um, and that um, promotes dis disorder of the transition metal. So these two black arrows just represent all that has to happen is one manganese here undergoes one hop to a, a vacant lithium site, another one here to the next vacant lithium site, and you've created this small vacancy cluster. You now have these two uh, sort of orphaned oxygens here, which can form molecular oxygen-oxygen bonds with these oxygens here to form dioxygen trapped in these vacancy clusters. And of course, the strong driving force for this structural reorganization is that by uh, forming these strong covalent oxygen-oxygen bonds, that helps to drive stabilization. Um, you don't really want to have oxidized oxide ions hanging around there are two common species of oxygen in the universe, uh, molecular oxygen um, and then in solid state uh, oxide ions. And so it's not unreasonable that you move from an, a, a, a stable oxide ion when you try to oxidize it to something that is molecular oxygen if it can do so. And then on discharge, uh, you reduce these uh, dioxygens back to oxide ions. The lithium ions come back into the structure but they don't go into the same position. They now go into these filling up the, the sites in these cationic vacancy uh, clusters that you see here. So you can contrast this, the pristine material with the discharge material, a different arrangement of lithiums. And crucially, as we'll see in the next slide, a different arrangement of um, lithium around the oxide ions that have reformed here. So lithium returns to different sites. The structure on discharge reduction is different from the structural change on charge, and that's in keeping with the voltage hysteresis that you see. So to get a sense of, of the main energetic driving force for these changes, we can look at this um, diagram of the, of the oxygen 2p states and how they, 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 they change. So here's the an oxide ion in our pristine material um, with a transition metal layer above it with two manganese. I've just used manganese for the transition metal ions to keep it simple and lithium up here and then three lithiums in the alkali metal layer. And this would be a sort of valence band of oxygen here representing the oxygen valence states which are formed by interaction with the surrounding metal ions. Now if we pick out these, this oxygen 2p orbital in particular um, it's interacting with lithium ions. This is an ionic interaction. It's a very weak interaction. And so these oxygen 2p states will tend to be relatively high in energy because covalency drags them down. There's very little covalency here. So they will tend to sit at the top of the, near the top of the oxygen valence band. And these are the ones, of course, that are preferentially oxidized uh, when you charge. If you contrast this with where we end up at the end of discharge, which are oxygens surrounded by lithium entirely. These are the oxygens that reform in that, in that vacancy cluster. Now they're all surrounded by lithiums when the lithiums go back in. So all of these 2p states are now surrounded by lithium. All of them are very weak interactions. You have this sort of 
orphaned oxide iron, if you like. Um, and since all of them are in this weak interacting state, these oxygen 2p states will tend to be even higher in energy. Higher in energy means lower voltage, and that's part of what gives rise to this lower voltage at the, on discharge um, than, than charge. I mean, you must remember that these very isolated molecular orbital pictures are not really uh, a true representation of a solid since you never get you know, uh, isolated orbitals like this. Um, there will always be a degree of uh, interaction hybridization. So it's the net effect of the interaction of these oxygen 2p states with their environment that is important and shifts this, this up. So what um, happens on the second cycle where we have smaller hysteresis, um, as you see uh, here? So on the second cycle, you oxidize. You go back to molecular oxygen, and we can see this in the RICs, reforming molecular oxygen. But of course, you don't have to reorganize the structure to do so, because these vacancies are here. Uh, you just drop these lithium ions out, reform the structure. And when you discharge again, you will come back to the same basic structure. So this is in keeping with the fact you know, that you come back to the same energetic point here uh, that you started from on the second cycle, which is different from the first cycle. You know, there's no difference in the end point from the beginning here in the second cycle there is in the first cycle. Um, there will still be some structural um, changes because going from this to accommodate molecular oxygen, there will be some uh, structural uh, strain involved, so you would expect some small hysteresis, but it's in, it's 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 in keeping with this being being less than 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 the large one volt change uh, here. So more reversible on the multi on the second cycle, but it's still you see molecular oxygen formation and then its reduction back to oxide ions. So if this is the mechanism by which um, oxygen redox happens, the reversible part of the oxygen redox, not the oxygen loss. Um, how can we think about maybe mitigating this because we would like to stay on that voltage plateau? Well, you can get a bit of a clue by looking at these materials. Now, these are sodium intercalation compounds. They're layered compounds, a different structure. Uh, let me just show you the structure here. Uh, this time, because sodium is the, um, in the alkymetal layers, sodium prefers trigonal prismatic coordination, and that changes the stacking sequence here. But otherwise, it's it's very similar to the materials we've just been looking at. But the interesting thing here is these two materials, very similar composition, same crystal structure, very different electrochemistry. This one has voltage hysteresis, the 0.75 material. This one exhibits what we would really like to have would be going back and forth pretty much along this plateau. This is the 0.6 composition. So similar crystal structures, same crystal structure, in fact, very similar compositions, very different electrochemistry. So what is different about these two materials? Well, the main difference actually turns out to be the superstructure. So here's the superstructure. This is a powder diffraction pattern for the 0.75 material. And this is the transition metal layer again. And you see, again, this honeycomb superstructure. When we look at the 0.6 material, the one that shows the reversibility that we would like in, 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 in voltage, here are the superstructure peaks. It's a different superstructure. We've called it a ribbon superstructure. I'll just highlight the ribbons here. Okay, so not the honeycomb structure that we're used to. And honeycomb structure is almost ubiquitous in lithium-rich compounds that, of course, again, all show this first uh, cycle voltage hysteresis. Uh, this is a much less common uh, superstructure. But this seems to be a major reason for the ability to retain the crystal structure to not undergo those changes that allow molecular oxygen uh, to form. And you can see that here. Here's the stem images again. This is the pristine material. It's a different arrangement here, not, a, not the dumbbell because it's not honeycomb. On charge, you see this retention of the structure and it's the same on discharge. You can see in the PXRD, the superstructure peaks here, you see these in these grade regions, reappear on discharge. Um, there's the pristine material, they're still there on discharge. And here's the lithium NMR, pristine, and at the end of discharge, um, very much the same, same position for the, for the lithium resonances. Everything is structurally stable as one would expect with the voltage retention. 
And it's the ability to retain the Rubin structure that is responsible for maintaining the high voltage cycling. And so if you look at the, um, another type of spectroscopy, actually absorption spectroscopy that you see here, um, it's another way of probing the oxygen states, this, the, the OK edge spectroscopy. Here's the, 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 the spectrum for the pristine in black, uh, the charged material in red, and the discharged in blue. Um, and these states here that are represented uh, by this change in the absorption spectrum uh, at 531 EV, these are the states that we actually saw in the RICS. These are the molecular oxygen states. If you look at the ribbon structure, this is the honeycomb structure. If you look at the ribbon structure, um, there are still some of those molecular oxygen states present because uh, as you will have seen, we don't get complete reversibility across the whole of the load curve towards the latter part of discharge, the voltage drops again. But the important point is you see this new signature in the XAS, um, which uh, is not present here and is actually indicative of the creation of true whole states on oxide ions. And so this is, this is the oxygen redox we want to see if we want to get good reversibility um, of the uh, potential along that first uh, plateau. So I think I should bring my talk to an end at this point here. Uh, as I say, we've DFT a lot of other data and I could talk more about the sodium compounds uh, as well and show you more evidence for the honeycomb changing in the case of the 0.75. But I think that allows me to give the main messages um, that it appears that the main mechanism that underpins the oxygen redox, or at least the reversible oxygen redox chemistry, at least in these 3D compounds, which we focused on, is this formation of um, molecular oxygen on charge, um, and then it's reduction to, to oxide ions on, on discharge. And this, of course, uh, signposts some possible directions that one might think about in terms of trying to mitigate that, uh, one of which I've shown you in terms of the superstructure. Not to say by any means that that is solved um, uh, or the problem of voltage hysteresis is solved, that's not the point, but, but I think it does give us at least one way of thinking about the challenges uh, that that presents. And with that, I want to thank all the uh, people who have done all the hard work. Um, thank you again and the, and the team at Stanford for the invitation to do this, and of course all of you across the world um, uh, for, uh, for listening. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for the deep dive into uh, the oxygen redox in, in the castle. Uh, a lot of good insight right there. Um, there and also many questions from the audience. Um, let me start from the first one. This one person asking you um, to define the oxygen redox a little bit, you know, uh, what exactly is the oxygen re redox and this content right there? Um, so, yeah. Okay, so if you take a, a conventional transition metal uh, ion redox like nickel two plus, you remove an electron from nickel two bus, you form nickel three plus. So in the case of an oxide ion, it's very much the same. Uh, you've got an oxide ion with a completely filled outer shell. You take an electron from the oxide ion. If you took one electron per oxide, it would be nominally an O minus species that you would form. Of course, again, in a solid, you can't really speak of that level of localization, but that's what we mean by oxygen oxidation. And then the reduction part is just you know, you're putting those electrons back on when you discharge. So just as we can think, think of uh, charging and discharging a conventional uh, cathode uh, in, as involving removing electrons from the transition metal ions and putting them back on oxidation and reduction. Um, it's the same process for the oxide. It's just that up until maybe a few years ago, uh, it was widely believed that that couldn't be done with oxides. With sulfides, it's quite common. You can go from S2 minus with um, two minus charge in each sulfur to uh, an S2, that's two sulfur um, atoms with an overall two minus. Um, that's pretty common and well known, uh, but the oxide is somewhat different. Yeah, well, I guess Peter, maybe from this person, uh, I, I guess the, the thinking is uh, transition metal and oxygen, uh, the p orbital always have certain degree of hybridization. 
ha- happened right. right there. Um, so I right. think it's probably the percentage issue when you do transition metal uh, uh, redox, right there, you are really affecting very little, you know, you utilize very little contribution from oxygen P orbitals. Then once you go higher and higher voltage, it will increase more and more of the, it becomes, uh, become mainly oxygen, less on transition metal. Uh, right. Yeah. So of course, there, there's no such thing as a pure d orbital or a pure oxygen two p orbital in these systems. It's absolutely right. I mean, there is always a mixing um, and some kind of um, degree of covalency. But it's true in the 3D systems in particular, um, which are uh, largely because the d orbitals are concentrated and you have a high so-called on-site Hubbard U parameter you have a big energy difference in the different oxidation states. And so um, in a situation like that, you have much more localization than you do do in the the heavy transition metals. And so it's it's to a first approximation reasonable to talk about, at least in some of the transition metal ions, redox processes happening mainly on the transition metal ion. And then when you get down into the deeper oxygen states, processes that are mainly on the oxygen. So yeah, there'll still be a, a, a certain degree of transition metal character in these oxygen redox processes I mentioned. Some cases I would say, if I remember from the DFT, it's maybe about 20%. But you can still think of this as ostensibly a, a, an oxygen process. And I think you get a clue from that, from the load curve, as I showed, you know, you, the behavior changes when you've, you've exhausted all the transition metal oxidation and you move into the other one. So there is a difference. It's not a continuum process. So you think you can think about transition metal and oxygen redox. Yeah, okay, very, very good, Peter. Uh, next question. Um, when you are describing this from the audience, I, I just rephrase it. Uh, you start to charge. Uh, once you charge, these uh, manganese uh, move to the neighboring site. Uh, then the, que- the question is, and on the transition metal layer, you know, this manganese can move in plane inside the layer, can also move out of the plane going down to the, the lithium layer. So why, why not lithium layer? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, there is some, uh, and we've measured it, and it's, as I said, about 6% of the transition metal ions uh, do drop into the, uh, to the layer below. I guess um, there are a number of potential reasons why it appears to be dominantly occurring in the in the transition metal layer. Um, one of them is, of course, that that the the if you like the size of the sites in the transition metal layer are already in, uh, optimal for the manganese to migrate into. You know, because if you look at the the the, the lithium sites in in the alkyl metal layers, although we describe them all as octahedral, the dimensions are quite are, are somewhat different, right? And so and so it's 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 energetically more favorable, I think, for the for the manganese to move into a neighboring site in the transition metal layer mm-hmm. uh, than it is to move into the uh, uh, into the to the to the layers uh, below. I mean, we have explored both of these things, and of course, experimentally, as you saw from the stem images, you can see that there's very little. Uh, metal scattering from the alkali metal layers. So it, mm-hmm. if you look at evidentially, it appears that's what's happening. In terms of interpreting why it happens, I think that would be one of the reasons. It's one one hop, if you like. It's not very, very different to go into the alkali metal layers, to be, to be fair, the distances are not greater. But I suspect it's the matching of the sizes that maybe makes it easier um, for that to happen. Yeah, good. Uh, next one. Um, what's the difference in your rigs, the uh, resonant uh, uh, and, and elastic uh, x-ray technique, right? What do you expect? What's the difference? If the oxygen O2 species, they could be charged peroxo or silver oxo like rather yeah, than it's... neutral oxygen. So what will be the difference in, in, in the uh, spectrum? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point and I probably should have put it into the Rick spectrum. So apologies for that. but. Uh, it, the, the peroxo species produce um, a Rick signature that's that's very clearly different from the from the molecular oxygen uh, um, uh, spectrum that you saw. So the, um, I don't know if we can go back to it, but if we can't, 
don't worry about it. But but um, well, actually, let me maybe if I've still got control of the screen, I can quickly yeah, please. Do that. Um, so that's great. So let me just quickly um, go back to the relevant spectrum. These peaks you see here are actually vibrational states for molecular oxygen. Okay, so this is the elastic peak of Riggs, and this is basically the set of vibrational states for oxygen, and they match very, very closely the spacings uh, that for molecular oxygen. Now, if you have a peroxo species, it will appear in a different place in the in the uh, in the Riggs spectrum. And really, the reason we've identified this is that this is high resolution Riggs. Um, most Riggs is 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 it doesn't offer you the ability to resolve what would just look like an envelope in here, but it's the ability to resolve these and identify these spacings as fitting the vibrational spectrum of molecular oxygen, which helps to tie this down. But the real short answer to your question is the peroxo species appear uh, quite differently in the Rick spectrum. So there's no, it's not like you're just looking at a, you know, a small uh, and somewhat ambiguous difference. Okay. So, so Peter, next one um, from the audience. The oxygen loss of lithium-rich cathode occurs at a wattage of 4.8 watt. But the amount of oxygen loss is also very limited from the DEMS result, DEMS. Uh, his or her question is, how much oxygen loss in total um, that caused the wattage fade during cycling. So this is oxygen gas loss, this uh, person indicate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, this depends on, um, for different materials, depends actually on the, uh, uh, the, if the coatings of the material. So one of the efforts to make these materials useful uh, is that a number of groups have done some very nice work um, applying coatings and surface modifications uh, to reduce the oxygen loss um, and you can get up to you know, 90 percent uh, capacity um, retention on the first cycle. But in the case of the data you saw there, um, it's, it's uh, I think it's about 30 milliamp hours per gram or something even less than that I think. It's, a, it's about 10 percent of the oxygen redox capacity is associated with the actual oxygen loss at the surface, the irreversible oxygen loss. And the rest of it is all associated with the, what I would call the reversible oxygen redox um, that's, that's related to the oxygen trapped in the solid part. Yeah. You know, you know, Peter, very early on, you started doing lithium oxygen, you know, and, and really motivate many people to go in. And, and Carol, you also have very exciting work doing oxygen chemistry, uh, your uh, nature paper, I think. Um, so what's your, your guys' comment on the future of lithium air and uh, in general, the metal air batteries? And uh, you can open up as broad as you want and make, make comments, yeah. Well, it's a big, it's a, that's a big question. Um, we could, I'm sure Cal and I could give you an hour on all this stuff. Uh, how do I make it short? Well, two, two minutes each at most, okay. Yeah, no, 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 don't worry. I, was, I, wasn't war I wasn't warming up to take the rest of the 10 minutes. Don't worry, don't worry. Uh, I think the, I suppose the first thing to say is that, um, you know, despite everything that Carl and I have talked about, this afternoon in terms of the, uh, what I would call the conventional uh, type of lithium ion battery and even going to lithium metal anodes and things, you know, the world's gonna need energy storage that goes beyond what we're ever gonna get from this technology. And uh, if we've learned anything with it, with maybe with the COVID pandemic in most countries is, hey, wait a minute, guys, if you uh, just ignore the possible dangers in the future, uh, they'll come at you much more quickly than you expect and you're not ready to deal with them. So. Uh, I think it's wise to, uh, to to plan for a little bit longer term than next year, right? Um, and so I think the, what lithium air, lithium air battery can do, um, it, at least in principle, is give you a specific energy in particular at a whole systems level that will be very, very hard or probably impossible to realize with a lithium ion. I mean, if we, we ran some numbers recently actually using the modifications of the Argon software, and, you know, you can show that with the knowledge that's been developed uh, by people like Carl and others, including some of the work we've done uh, over the last few years, 
you can predict that you'll get about 600 watt hours per kilogram from a lithium air battery. That's at the full system level, taking account of the balance of plant, all the air handling, etc. And one of the reasons for that is we now know that uh, you can work with uh, concentrations of um, uh, one molar water in the electrolyte. You know, you don't have to get it dry to one ppm. So that just illustrates two things. It illustrates that there's been advances in understanding the lithium oxygen chemistry, which has actually removed or reduced some of the challenges that people thought would be really very hard to overcome. Um, it's been shown you can cycle these things at about one or two milliamps per square centimeter, that's weight, at several milliamp hours per square centimeter capacity. Um, whereas, you know, 10 years ago, we thought it would be microamps and, and nothing like that. Um, the, the, uh, the use of redox mediators has been able to bring the, 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 the voltage gap between charge and discharge down. So there's a lot of advances that have come through from the basic science. Um, there's still a lot of problems, right? I mean, one of them is the stability issue of electrolytes, probably the biggest remaining problem. But again, through the recognition of single oxygen formation on charging, uh, that I touched on, in fact, in terms of the, uh, the, the lithium-rich cathodes. Um, we think that's now our major factor in the decomposition of the electrolytes. So if one could re remove that problem, and it's largely removed by reducing the charging voltage, you could, you could perhaps reduce the single oxygen generation and much improve the, the degradation. So I'm just run through a few things there just mm -hmm. to give people a flavor of some of the things that have happened uh, that have addressing some of the challenges that people uh, recognized, uh, but at the same time, recognizing that there's still a long way to go. Um, there are still important problems to be solved. But I don't think uh, we should, I think there is still potential in this technology, um, difficult and challenging though it is. And as I say, the, 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 the goal of being able to achieve something around 600 watt hours per kilogram at the whole systems level you know, that's to be compared with a full battery pack of a lithium ion. Um, it could be so important in some areas, maybe even in aviation, that it is, it is worth uh, maintaining an important effort in those kind of advanced, challenging and far reaching potential technologies. Well, I think uh, that summarized pretty much everything. Uh, you know, one, one thing, it's, it's really, I agree with him when you talk about the energy density. If you use like an oxygen tank, or whatever, it's going to be a significant drop, obviously, and that defeats the purpose. Uh, what we're doing at Argon is a little different now. Uh, it's not really lithium air. Um, it's trying to, uh, to stabilize the uh, lithium superoxide, uh, the crystalline phase, which is... Uh, you know, so to prevent disproportionation. And we proved that concept, we're working it very hard. If we can do that, then we have a closed system, uh, basically like lithium ion. So you start with the, uh, an electrode, a cathode, which is a lithium superoxide and a lithium metal, and you shuttle lithium between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, now this material is more conductive, so dissociation of the lithium oxygen bond is much easier. And uh, so if we can do that uh, with the right electrolyte, uh, I think there is an opportunity to have a closed system where you can use the same conventional uh, process that, uh, that the lithium ion is using, uh, assuming that within the next few years, uh, lithium metal stabilization could be uh, achieved. Then maybe there is an opportunity. But otherwise, if you, uh, if you talk about lithium air, like what uh, Peter mentioned, there is a lot of challenges and the gain in energy is going to be also uh, not very significant. And uh, so... Uh, the bottom line is that I think we should continue is a challenge in, you know, for scientific uh, curiosity is big, big challenge. So it's good to, to continue. And then uh, if we can find a way to, uh, you know, if you look, there is several lithium, you know, you move from lithium uh, superoxide to peroxide uh, reversibly. If you can do that, that's great. Uh, then you can add one more lithium and increase further the energy, uh, which is much more challenging. Uh, so, uh, that's the, uh, at least that's what we're doing. We have a big effort in this area now. Uh, it's most of our focus in, uh, to, uh, to enable the, the closed system, uh, which very likely will be less challenging than uh, lithium air because lithium air, as uh, say you have uh, air or oxygen coming in, you have a potential uh, uh, crossover that can uh, affect your, uh, your anode. You have 
uh, many many other uh, many other things that uh, that Peter mentioned that, that make it very very challenging. But it's not going to be happening within the next ten years. It may take longer. Thank you, Cal. So we have a few minutes left. Let me ask uh, both of you uh, one last question. Uh, because there's many uh, young faculties and young students, I, I think in the audience right there, uh, both of you looking at your career, I may ask a similar question at last time to uh, Stan and, and Jun. Uh, well, Kel, I look at you, like you work on many topics and each topical area, you, you, you always have you know, come up with great ideas, you know, very, very impressed, very broad range of topic. Peter, also you as well, you know, a cathode, uh, whether it's uh, oxygen chemistry, right? It's a really big wide variety of topics. Anything you want to share with young students and young faculties? They're, they're starting off their career, only going to a career for a you know, short, short time, not very long yet. The, the lessons learned, you can share with them to, to build their career in the energy storage space. Well, maybe Peter can go first. He's going to have more wisdom, I guess. <laughs> no, I, so I can second that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Go on, you go. I took the last one first. You can go for this one. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, um, you know, one thing is that, uh, at least in my career, first of all, the, 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 the work we're doing at Argan is not just myself. We have a great team. Um, uh, my, my folks that work with me and my collaborators. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a group an effort that is much more uh, broader than just myself. So that's maybe one thing. So collaborating is a good thing. You know, initiating collaboration with the established scientists uh, maybe can help the, drive the curiosity of young people. Uh, but uh, well, one thing I would like to advise is, uh, you know, relying on one topic usually you basically narrow your, your focus. Uh, you have to have much broad, broader area of your, you know, you, you know, uh, people who work in their, in their PhD on a topic, they cannot bring that topic to the uh, on energy. So just for example, in my case, I work on fluorine chemistry. So I was able to bring in some of the ideas from uh, my past work to, to, uh, to, uh, to the energy storage, uh, you, know, uh, you know, activity. So the, the other things is that uh, the young scientists should not just rely on established scientists work and try to to, uh, to just do an incremental change. Uh, I think you have to look beyond the box and try to be more creative. This is how you can uh, make, a, make a name for yourself. So if you, you know, I look for example, uh, just give an example of sulfur. I looked at the paper in sulfur. Uh, I would say uh, 70 to 80% of the work is just to incorporate lithium in, in carbon, uh, sulfur in carbon, uh, because some, some people have done that and show some good results. So big chunk of the effort has been on that. Instead of addressing all the key, 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 uh, key area that uh, that need to be addressed, so one has to not to just follow. You have to look beyond uh, what people have done and try to come up with some of their own contributions. So those are my advice to young people. And Peter? Yeah, I mean, I think that's very, very. The last point that Carl made is absolutely right. I mean, the the important thing to do is to look for look for something new. Um, I think that, that you know there's a danger, and it's not a criticism of any any one because it's to some extent the nature of the way things are. But there's a danger that we all um, sort of pile into the same problem, you know, and 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 try to solve the same problem. And I think you need to have a level of pluralism in science. You know, you need to be looking at different things, trying. Uh, imaginative and adventurous uh, ideas, uh, because you know, and it, it's not—it's not everyone should do that. There's a place for saying, you know, here's some very specific targets, and here's a, a roadmap, and you should follow that. And some people should do that, but not everyone should do it. Some people should really try to do some creative stuff, some off the wall things, some things that don't look promising, that you can't predict. You know, that if you were ahead of a of an industrial R&D lab, you would never let anyone do this because it wouldn't make sense. It's not sensible for a business. Uh, but that's what academia is there to do, right? To think, think the unthinkable, to try new things. Um, so you need both these things. And some people will be more suited to one than the other, but both are important and both should be respectful, I think, of the other. So I would say if you're one of those people that likes that certainty in the roadmap, then that's fine. But also it's good if you want to be creative and think out of the box and explore 
uh, uh, new things. I mean, I started my career in solid electrolytes, I mean, ceramic solid electrolytes. And whoever thought they would become, they would come back into fashion, right? So uh, <laughs> uh, on the way, I did a lot of work on polymer electrolytes and, 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 and all these things. And so, you know, you also see that what goes around comes around. So don't assume that something has been done 20 years ago and therefore it's all done and it's all, you know, been shown to never work and will never happen again, because these things uh, do have a habit of, 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 of coming around. Um, I'll just say one thing though, a um, uh, little bit to come back on the lithium, lithium air, lithium oxygen, because um, uh, I think Carl's approach is, is, is very interesting, but I just wanted to re reiterate that the recent modeling that we did based on what is known about lithium air now, um, and this is using air, not oxygen, not oxygen tanks, um, predicts a fully functional system with close to 600 watt hours per kilogram. Okay, now mm -hmm. that is, that is, that is um, not working on, as I say, not working on oxygen, not taking into account of tanks. What's the difference? One of the differences is when you use redox mediators, you form the lithium peroxide in pores in solution in the electrodes, so you can have thick electrodes. Also, another change is that you're assuming you're using protected lithium metal, which we're going to need for all sorts of things, you know, anyway. And so um, I just wanted to put that out there because I think there are some assumptions from the work of five or six years ago that these things are not possible. Um, now, as I say, I'm not pretending that all the problems of lithium oxygen are solved, but I say again, you know, we've demonstrated one milliamp per square centimeter, which is a pretty reasonable rate. We've demonstrated several milliamp hours per square centimeter capacity. Um, for sure, degradation, cyclability, plenty of things still to solve. But that model is using, you know, that modeling, that techno-economic modeling is, is based on what we know now uh, um, without any assumptions beyond the fact that we know, for example, that we can work with 13% relative humidity in the gas stream and it doesn't kill the electrode doesn't kill the cell you know so we can have water there we can have humidity in that in that in that in that uh, in inlet air um, you don't have to have super dry air for example so these are some of the changes that have happened in our understanding that mean that you can predict those kind of uh, potential performances um, but it's mm -hmm. so I just say that because again it's exciting to work on these problems right and 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 they may may this may never still come to anything right but I would want people to especially new people entering the field, and I'm not making a pitch they should work on lithium oxygen, but they should think broadly, you know, think imaginatively, do something new, right? Yeah, very good. So uh, what I get out from both of you, we need a diverse background, expertise, diverse problems, be open, be persistent. Mm -hmm. That's what I get out from both of you. Uh, with that, I think I would like to conclude today's uh, second event of Storage X Symposium. Um, I would like to thank you both of you for your you know, great speech and also sharing your perspective. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next week's uh, event, uh, we have also two experts joining us next week, uh, Yogan Janet and Linda Nassar next Friday. I look forward to seeing everybody next Friday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day or good, good day. evening. Thanks, Gene. Bye. Bye now. Bye, everyone.